Good morning. My name's uh, Fiona Kamari Campbell. I am a professor of disability and ableism studies in the School of Education and Social Work at the University of Dundee. And welcome, I'm really, really excited. Welcome to our third Disability History Month event. And we have Dr. Katrina Stewart uh, from SWAN. I'll introduce her formally in a minute to discuss uh, autism and reasonable adjustments in the workplace. Now, we've already had two events, so uh, it's been great. This event is being pre-recorded and um, will be available on the University of Dundee's YouTube page. So don't worry if you've uh, not been able to uh, register or, you, or you've missed out. You, you'll be able to access that via the University of Dundee's YouTube page. And just as a reminder, we have a whole series of other events coming up. We've got an event on the 2nd of December and on the 3rd of December, I'm really, really proud to say and really excited to say that we have the first annual uh, Eddie Small Disability Lecture. So that will be on every year. And this year we have Mr. John Horan, who's going to speaking, speak, who's going to speak to us about being one of two disabled barristers in the whole of the UK specialising in equalities laws. So we'll put the link up uh, to the uh, Disability History Month um, events uh, so you can uh, book in for some of the other events that we have available. So as I said, it is going to be recorded. Uh, you might be wondering why we don't have BSL uh, available for today's event event. Uh, and that's a good question. Uh, one of the things is technology often doesn't keep up with uh, the requirements and Teams Live, which is what we're currently using now, does not allow us to have two screens up at once, which is why you're just seeing me. Um, so we're not able to provide BSL using this platform this for this event. But the good news is that um, Teams Live will be um, introducing a new platform very soon. So we'll, we will be able to do that. OK, I'd like to introduce Dr. Katrina Stewart, OBE. She's such an amazing, wonderful woman and she lives and breathes autism. She is an autistic woman herself, but she also is an autistic researcher and she's done extensive work on autism, particularly around the situation of uh, women and girls um, who were autistic. And she was the founder and uh, a member of SWAN, which is the Scottish Women's Autism Network. And SWAN is uh, also running an employment project, which you'll hear about. And um, she's been doing lots of work uh, led by uh, autistic women and girls around autism in, um, in general. Now, why this question? Uh, I should disclose I'm actually on the board of SWAN, so I know Katrina. Um, and as an autistic woman myself, I um, was going through the process of uh, uh, um, having a discussion about uh, reasonable adjustments for myself. And I realised, in fact, that even though I was an autistic woman, I had very little knowledge about what reasonable adjustments um, were available to me, what was possible, what was doable um, in the university context, what other uh, students and staff had, uh, had used in terms of reasonable adjustment. And of course, all this is a challenge because autistic people are a very diverse bunch. So now let me, uh, so that was the basis of this discussion. So what's going to happen is Katrina is going to speak for roughly 20 minutes. If she speaks too long, I'll let her know. Um, and then Katrina and I will speak for another 15 minutes just in discussion, following up the issues. And then we will open up for question and answers. And there's a question and answers tab on your site. Uh, please, if you have questions, uh, you can put those questions throughout the session when Katrina and myself are talking, uh, but we will um, address those questions only at the end after we've finished our conversation. So I'm going to, with no further ado, I'm going to uh, introduce, uh, hand over to the wonderful Katrina Stewart and uh, um, let's see what she's, what she's got to say about autism and reasonable adjustment in the workplace. Over to you, Katrina. Fiona, thank you so much for that really lovely introduction. I'm gonna do my best to live up to it. Um, I do eat, eat, breathe and sleep autism, like you say, so, so that's probably a good place to start. And as we were saying earlier, the fact there's been so much interest in this um, event suggests that this is a question that people, you know, really want to get into a conversation about, So, which, which is very exciting. So thank you so much for asking me to, to kind of join you with this um, amazing thing that you're doing. So UK Disability History Month. 
um, really interesting series of talks you've had on. Um, so yes, yeah, so I founded SWAN, uh, Scottish Women's Autism Network in 2012, and I did that on the back of my PhD, which was focused on autistic uh, girls and anxiety. Um, and um, we've just we've just gone on since then, really. Um, it's a peer led, um, it's autistic led, it's mostly run by volunteers. It's autistic women who come to SWAN looking for support, advice, guidance, tips, self knowledge, community, and and they quite often stay to share the benefits of what they've got out of out of that um, experience. So. Recently, so sorry, we became a charity in 2016, I should say. And then last year, my full time employer, Scottish Autism, seconded my post for three years to work strategically with SWAN to try and to, not to try, but to get SWAN onto a sustainable footing. And that's what I'm doing at the moment. And one of the things that we've done over the last year is we've received funding from the Scottish Government as part of their Improving Understanding of Autism campaign. And our funding is to run an employment project. It's a one year pilot um, to uh, work with autistic women in employment um, and we're doing this in two ways. Well, we're doing it in lots of ways, but there are two basic principles. One is that we support the autistic employee with advice, coaching and mentoring. And then we also support the employer to create a more inclusive workplace. Um, we launched the project in March um, and then by June we had one member of staff in place, Lynn Reid. And then the fabulous Lynn Reid and the fabulous Lindsay McAdam joined us in September. So I've got a really brilliant um, project management team and um, it's really exciting the work that's been, been going on. So just a couple of snippets about legislation. A lot of you will know, some of you possibly don't, but the Scotland Act 1998 basically aligned us with the European Convention on Human Rights. Um, so what that means is in Scotland, civil and political rights are protected by the Human Rights Act 1998 and provisions in the Scotland Act 1998. And these rights come from the European Convention on Human Rights and they include rights relating to employment, housing, health, education and adequate standards of living. We also have in the UK, we have the Equalities Act 2010. And under that act, um, people with protected characteristics are entitled to reasonable adjustments. Um, this is a kind of slightly controversial piece of wording because who decides what are reasonable adjustments? Um, it's open to interpretation and that can be quite challenging. So both for employers, presumably, and as well as employees. Um, I think it's also worth saying that under Europe uh, United Nations law, um, Autism is defined as a disability. Now, in that in that definition, um, it, their definition of disability sits somewhere between what we call the social model of disability and the medical model of, of a mental health disorder, which is how autism is defined medically. It's not a mental health disorder. It's a brain difference. Our brains develop differently than other people's, which is not a disorder in itself. So I'm just going to say that very emphatically. Um, because it, because it causes confusion as much as anything else. There's some other issues around this, which we, we, we can't go into a lot of detail here, but I know for some people it will be there as questions. Not all autistic people, people uh, define themselves as disabled. Um, so there's, so there's, some question, there's some questions around that, but the reality is if you want to look for reasonable adjustments or accommodations in the workplace, you need to decide how you are going to de define your need for those things. Um, so who decides what are reasonable adjustments? What is the cost of these adjustments? And who pays the cost of putting them in place or of them not being put in place? And those were questions that I wanted to kind of sort of hang over this whole conversation because um, I think they're really, really important um, and actually core to the to the whole conversation. I do mention, I do talk about that uh, more further on. So we started the, the employment project in uh, in March, actually, I started it. Um, but then, like I say, we, we Lynn came, came on board in June and then Lindsay in September. So in a few months, we have engaged with 
around 18 women and their employers. And those employment contexts cover supermarkets, cinema, local authority, primary and secondary school and universities, the travel industry, prison, occupational health, primary and secondary education, hospital staff. And we've also involved other agencies such as Remploy, uh, unions, Equate Scotland, solicitors. We have delivered advice, coaching, mentoring, in workplace support, including grievance procedures and back to work processes, employment and team training. And we're working with six um, sort of individual companies, mentoring, advising, networking, some of the women that have that have come to us. How does it work? Just so you know, if you are an autistic woman and you are struggling at work or you have questions around your employment or you're seeking employment and struggling to kind of access that, then please get in touch with us because we will we will come back to you and have a conversation with you about what it is you need and what we can do. So the adjustments and the accommodations for autistic employees, one of the things that's really come out for me over the last few months is how employment employers often um, struggle to understand what they, they might look like. Um, you know, what do they look like? Are they expensive? Are they going to cause organisational upheaval? I think there's quite a lot of anxiety around this area because employers, HR, line managers, they don't actually understand what they mean. And unfortunately, neither quite often do the autistic employees because there is no handbook of what a reasonable adjustment is um, or a list of reasonable adjustments. And what is going to be helpful for one autistic woman in one employment context may be absolutely irrelevant to another autistic woman in in another uh, employment context. Um, and a little kind of anecdote that um, I'd like to share is the employee who was offered, who works as a, I have to say she works as a, a kind of management, uh, you know, kind of uh, context in a big open plan office with lots of people and lots of running about to do and they offered her a weighted blanket and of course she didn't like to say no because she didn't want to seem as if she was being ungrateful and that's the kind of thing where even well-meaning suggestions can be really not not helpful. So is there a handbook? Well there isn't one and um, there's lots of ideas and lots of suggestions but actually as part of our employment project it's one of our tasks we've given ourselves to draw one up um, because we're in such a good position to do that now. So we'll be working on that. Um, so one of the things we've been doing, uh, well, Lindsay and Lynn have been doing um, during this project is they've been pulling out themes because th this is new work we're doing. This is, you know, we haven't done this before. There's no template for this. Um, and it's really important that we actually evaluate and um, and pull out what, what, are, what are the key themes that are rising out of, out of this. So the key themes we have found are black, are fundamental lack of understanding of autism full stop and specifically lack of understanding of autism in the workplace. Poor communications is a is a big one which is not surprising as autism is as much about communication as it is about anything else different communication styles. Um, communication is a, is a circular process it's not really it's kind of one way thing is it so it's communications going every which way Perfectionism. I mean, what we find is that the themes relating to employers and employments, uh, employer workplaces, and the themes relating to the autistic employees and issues around their autism. So it's almost like it's a kind of it's a two two sided, um, you know, two columns here. Um, so perfectionism and what that actually means for the autistic employee as well as for their employer. Absent career support, coaching, mentoring, we're quite surprised to realise that a lot of these uh, autistic women didn't have any kind of sense of how to, um, you know, actually envisage a career pathway as opposed to just surviving in, in the job that they're in. Workplace bullying is, is definitely a thing and um, the anxiety and mental health issues arising out of an autistic person trying to manage in a non-autistic uh, environment. Um, I think it's probably worth mentioning at this point that um, it's really important to understand if we look about look at disability rights and we look at inclusion, social inclusion, for an autistic person to be working full time in a busy, noisy, smelly, demanding um, 
uh, environment means that actually by the time they get home of the evening, they are usually so exhausted that they spend all their free time recovering. And, and that is a huge quality of life issue, because if you're asking autistic people to fit in, in you know, in that environment, you're asking them to uh, weigh up you know, the benefits of being employment versus the impact on the rest of their quality of life and, and their inability then to access the other things that other people do and that they would like to, like spending time with their friends or their family or taking part in other activities. So it's a kind of trade, it's a trade-off situation very often for autistic people. Um, what does an employer get from an autistic employee? You know, what are the assets that we bring to what we do? Well, we're all very different. We're individuals, we're personalities, but there are some commonalities. Um, I, I've not actually ever met an autistic person that didn't genuinely want to do very well, either at school or in any job that, that we do. And that means we're generally extremely hard working. Autistic women, particularly because it's autistic women I, I know on the whole, um, we, we, we've got a terrible habit of being perfectionists. Um, and I've certainly, I've one of my one of my children is a perfectionist, and that's that's a fantastic asset in the in a, in the sense it's a fantastic asset in that you will get someone who has will see something through to the end, who will work to uh, a very high standard, and who will have uh, real attention to detail, and they'll want to do everything perfectly, and they'll research, they'll do the research, they'll have a look at other models, they'll go right, that's how I need to do this. Um, but I'll talk about the downside of that in a bit. They, we tend to be very loyal. Uh, we do tend to have attention to detail, but I wouldn't say that all autistic people are kind of fine detail people, at the, you know, to the detriment of the big blue sky thinking. I'm, I'm a very blue sky person um, and I'm a bit ADHD as well. So actually I have um, had some executive functioning issues, which means that I really wish I had a permanent uh, personal assistant and secretary, but um, never mind. Um, we're often very creative, we're often very good at problem solving. Um, so I, I don't know, I don't know if this, um, we'll see if anyone else wants to jump in and, and mention a few others in a, in a minute. Um, what are the other things we're identifying in this project? We're identifying barriers. So employer anxiety or distrust, you know, what is this going to mean if we have autistic employees and I have to make accommodations for them? I put employer fatigue in my notes and I, I think I think to be fair you know we've met people who are, are do genuinely think they are trying their best and, and they are trying their best but they're tired of getting it wrong and and that can be very destructive in the end because then they give up basically and they just want the nuisance to go away and it's sad because they're not bad they're not bad people and they don't you know um Management structures, I've put in flexibility and rigid thinking because, you know, um, it made me smile because actually we are supposed to be as autistic people and flexible and have very rigid thinking, but it's amazing how many non-autistic people you meet who can be incredibly inflexible <laughs> and rigid in their thinking because we like to stick to what we know, don't we? People generally, you know, they think they know what they're doing and it makes them feel secure and then they're having to kind of come out of their comfort zone and, and do things a different way. And a lot of managers, I think, have a very kind of clear way of managing. And when they come up against someone that doesn't work for, they don't know how to turn to a plan B. And I personally have come up against that. So, um, but it, is, it does seem to be a, a theme. We've come across a context where the actual organisation has fantastic policy, inclusion, disability policy, um, but, but what is less, uh, present is actually a system for making sure that there is support for the individual departmental you know um, departments and line managers because ultimately they are the people that have to kind of you know implement any any inclusive um, uh, uh, practices. Barriers for the autistic employee, exhaustion and damage mental health, top of the list, a lot of self-criticism, they're being prevented from meeting their potential and they're losing the ability to contribute their often very uh, not inconsiderable talents. So what are the solutions? I always like to always like to finish on an upbeat note because, you know, there's always going to be solutions because that's what we're here for. Um, 
What we're finding is that with the kind of help and support that is available, um, the autistic employee can build some self-awareness. One of the things we found over the years with SWAN is that just because you have a diagnosis of autism or you identify as being autistic, that doesn't necessarily mean you understand about autism because actually you're getting bombarded with a lot of nonsense, you know, a lot of really unhelpful, misguided information, out of date, negative deficit based information. So at SWAN, we're, um, we're trying to, we try to change that narrative of autism and we do that as much for um, we, we're trying to inform and educate society in general, and we do a lot of that. But what we're also doing is educating ourselves and informing ourselves and building a sense of who we, we are as autistic women. And that brings about strength and tools for self-care. And if you build in self-awareness and you build in self-assurance, it's easier then to start identifying, well, what do I need? You know, what kind of support do I need? And being able to articulate that and to share that with your colleagues and your uh, your managers. Um, we're also offering career coaching, career mentoring, peer mentoring. Autistic women who uh, come through the employment project obviously can can join the Swan networks. Five minutes, Katrina. Perfect. Thank you. Um, just coming to the last one. Just talking about the so solutions. Um, we have absolutely modelled what we're doing as we are here to help you. We're not here to go into places of employment and beat people over the head with, um, you know, a, a rolled up copy of the Equalities Act. Um, our, our, our purpose and our aim is to actually support employers to, to help build that more inclusive and diverse workplace. Um, we, we, we want to help employers to understand that reasonable adjustments and accommodations are not that difficult. They're not resource heavy, they're resource light very often. I mean, they might they might involve spending a little money, but, you know, um, not a huge amounts necessarily. What they need is goodwill and they need flexibility and they need a bit of creative thinking on your part um, as an employer. I'm assuming there are going to be some employers in this audience. Um, and if you can if you can create that environment for autistic people, it will bring dividends to your company and your organisation. The evidence is increasingly showing that a healthy work, a workplace, a healthy organisation includes a diversity of different employees um, in, in your organisation. And that diversity should include neurodiverse people whose brains think slightly outside the box. And you might have to accept that they're not going to be um, the favourite people in the office party, but they will bring other really, really valuable things to, to your organisation. Um, and I think really um, that's probably about not far off 20 minutes. And I would just like to say thanks again for inviting me today. And I want to say a huge thank you to Lynn Reed and Lindsay McAdam, the SWAN Employment Project um, management team, because they are they're brilliant. And um, thank you to all the women who put your faith in us. Really, really appreciate it. And, and thanks to the audience for listening. So that's me done. Great. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Katrina. That's uh, that's brilliant. And uh, um, as I said at the start of the introduction, this is the start of a conversation, not the end. And uh, uh, this is an exploratory inquiry into a, um, a new area of uh, autism and reasonable adjustments in the workplace. I must say it's quite amazing in 2020. It's still an emerging area. You wonder what folk have been doing over the years, uh, given that the Equalities Act has been in since 2010. But I'll just put that out there. So we've had quite a few questions that have come in and um, we'll get to those later. Um, I, I do want to say, however, some people um, uh, were concerned that slides hadn't been used. And uh, I think the this event, um, that using this technology is very challenging for, for speakers. And in this case, uh, Katrina was using the slides for her reference point. And we had a discussion about that, whether we would put up the slides. Actually, some people find slides a nuisance. <laughs> um, uh, so I understand that people have different needs that are there. We will make uh, a, a version of the slides available um, um, afterwards. Um, it's just a case of the speakers having to manage um, 
uh, different aspects of the software, which is uh, stressful in itself, as you could well imagine. So there's a couple of things I just wanted to have a chat with you about, Katrina, and you talked about all sorts of things. But um, one is the issue of um, if di of disclosure. I mean, at, um, this is being hosted by a university. Uh, one of the things that we found, uh, not just with autism, but with other disability groups, is that um, autistic and disabled people often don't disclose uh, their particular needs, don't disclose that they have a disability. And you mentioned one reason might be that, for example, that people might not consider themselves disabled and that often is an experience of people with autism, but also people who are deaf. Um, but as you pointed out, that sometimes you need to use things strategically uh, because uh, disability is a protected characteristic under the Equalities Act. But disclosure is appallingly low. Um, uh, I won't say what the numbers are here for, for our staff at the university, but I would say probably just guessing uh, that probably twice as many people uh, actually have a disability. So I'm just wondering if you could give us some insights into maybe what the what the issues are around disclosure. You've started signalling that, but to talk to us about what uh, what might be the challenges um, in disclosing and I guess the importance of disclosure. So over to you, Katrina. Okay, that's a really important question, Fiona, thanks. Um, yeah, it could be for, for a whole lot of reasons. I think um, primarily there are, there are definitely anxieties around um, what, what that might mean if, if people kind of feel that they don't really want an autistic person in the department. Now, it's not an unreasonable fear. You know, anecdotally, you hear stories of people who've worked uh, very effectively in their profession for years. They disclose that they've just they've got received a diagnosis of Asperger's and suddenly colleagues are saying, well, they shouldn't be doing that job then. Um, and, um, you know, I've I've come off a platform after doing a presentation to say National Autistic Society's Women's Conference or something like that. And I sat down next to a couple of professional clinical psychologists who said they know they're autistic, but there's absolutely no way they would disclose in, in, you know, in case it impacted on their credibility in their work. We hear of people, I, this is what something, I, this is where I get really ragey, I'm afraid, but, you know, uh, there's so much misinformation out there and that, that is, it goes back to the basic understanding of autism, which is one of the reasons I'm so proud to be so heavily involved with Scottish Government's Improving Understanding of Autism campaign, because I think we actually have to start somewhere and raising people's awareness of, of what autism actually is, because there's so much kind of stereotyping around that, that people kind of, they are anxious about being around autistic people because they don't quite know what that means. And are they going to be, but they're not empathic and they're not, you know, and blah, blah, blah. And we, the, one of the things I get really cross about is when young people get a diagnosis and then get told things like, well, of course, you'll never get married and have a family or you won't be able to work with children. And that actually, as a, as a researcher, if you, and I'm sure you'll relate to this, that for, for pre professionals to say things based on absolutely no evidence whatsoever it's just um makes me very cross yeah yeah so, you, you, so, you, you, i was just gonna say can i just chip in there this is the yeah. transition issue with this technology look i think you're actually right there's lots of mythologies around there and uh, like yourself i mean i certainly was advised to to not disclose being autistic um and then you get this kind of defense mechanism like well gee fiona you, you do so well you're a researcher you're a teacher uh, how could you be autistic? So it kind of plays on people's mythology around. And then there's the other challenge that everything I, now that I have disclosed, and I'm pretty out about being autistic, by the way, uh, but then there always is the danger that everything I do, every mannerism, every behaviour, every communication, yeah. is just seen through the lens of being autistic. So, and uh, actually you can have microaggressions as a result of that. That's absolutely right. I think it's, I, I, I think, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely right. I think the way I describe it is when you say you're autistic, you suddenly become slightly two dimensional. But in a more general sense, um, I mean, I actually, before I disclosed, because I found this one in 2012 before I had a, my own formal diagnosis, um, and I went to 2013, and then I didn't actually disclose for a while because I was really anxious about how it would impact on, on my kind of professional sta status. But I ended up asking um, some, some academics and I asked several colleagues and I asked two autistic researchers that I know, uh, well I don't actually know, I wrote to them and said what do you think and one said 
right? Yeah, absolutely. And the other one said, don't, just don't do it. Most of the non-autistic people said, don't do it. And then I asked my children and they kind of basically said, well, you kind of have to, don't you? Because it's really important. And I think that's right. I think, if, you know, for me, I'm out there because I think I am able to be and I can be. And it's really important that we start raising the profile of autistic people generally, but, but autistic women and girls. Um, and uh, because otherwise things aren't going to change, you know, um, it always has to be a personal thing. Yeah. But so, we, we won't create change if, pe if people are feel that they cannot disclose. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. And actually, what I'm thinking of is the, some of the equivalencies around the argument that was used a couple of decades ago about, you know, uh, gay people coming out. It's the kind of this visibility and it's myth breaking. And yes, and there's always uh, it can be quite scary and there's uh, there's risks. But I think visibility um, is really important. And that brings me to, I guess, one of the final things I want to ask you before we open up to Q&A is you talked about the end about the importance of self-awareness and um, and peer mentoring is one, one way of doing that. Um, um, I'm just wondering if you can comment on that because unfortunately the situation is, whether it be with aut autism or other disabilities, is that um, uh, the heavy lifting has to often be done done by us. Uh, you don't often get situations where employers are proactive about neurodiverse students, uh, students, sorry, staff, employees. So I'm wondering if you could say something about the kind of importance of self-awareness, mm -hmm. but also why is that the self-awareness doesn't become, what's the word, oh, it becomes damaging because I, I find it's quite stressful. Uh, over and over again to kind of disclose or uh, to do the heavy lifting around education. So I'm just wondering if you could say a little bit about that and after you finish we'll go to Q&A. Well I think, um, so you know, almost two questions there I think. Um, one of the things I realised, I've realised over the years is that the invisibility of the autistic uh, f female or Shall we say people who don't identify as as you know as male? Um, um, it's not just that we've been invisible to society; it's made us invisible to ourselves. I've done a presentation on this before, where I've talked about the importance of role models and how, when I was young, I turned to all sorts of interesting role models. Um, you know, because I, I I was at the back end point of of second wave feminism, so there were some fantastic people, fantastic people. Um, and I was having, you know, that I could think I could look up to and see a few, see myself, a future self there. But for, for most autistic women, that doesn't, it doesn't happen. And so there's a real lack of, there was a real lack of role models. There's a real lack of, of self-esteem because, of, because we spend so much of our lives trying to be something we're not and fit in with everybody else. It also makes, it also makes us very vulnerable to coercion and manipulation because we're always trying to please other people. So what happens is people come to Swan and they meet other women like them. They're not like them in terms of personality, background, life experiences in many, many ways, but actually we all get it. You know, if you go into a Swan meetup of lots of women and there's lots of small groups, the amount of laughter that's going on, um, you know, you, you, you just get a sense, you, suddenly you're in a situation where you're not having to work so hard to make yourself understood, you're laughing with people, you're sharing life experiences, you're giving each other kind of tips and strategies. It's it's partly it's partly about just not being feeling on your own anymore, that you're actually a part of community. And um, that goes back to the thing that you were saying about be taking responsibility for always educating people. That's the foil because it is exhausting. All that stuff is really, really tiring and it's quite demoralising sometimes and it's quite humiliating sometimes. I hate having to constantly ask people, especially people who should know better, to make adjustments for me or, you know, um, but I've learned to because actually I'm just tired of sitting through meetings and ending up in pain. So now I'm actually quite stroppy about it. But um, but yes, yeah, so that that being able to hang hang out with your peers actually is a great foil for all the heavy lifting stuff, I, I think. But it's also about it's also just about learning about yourself and realizing it is okay. It is okay to go. Hang on a minute. I've overcommitted myself. I'm about to hit a brick wall and burn out. So I need to remove myself now. That's something that actually we have to. Now, Ronnie Casement, who is one of our stalwart SWAN uh, volunteer facilitators, she's been with SWAN for a long time, and she also started up the 14 plus, uh, the young SWANs thing um, that we're now putting online. Um, she once talked about how when you start 
coming when you start finding out your finding yourself and your autistic identity there's a lot of unlearning to do and I just thought that was amazing you actually have to start unraveling the things that you have learned to do to accommodate everybody else and the non-autistic world that are actually damaging to you and you, you know that you actually start to assert yourself I just think all autistic people never mind girls or women but everyone should learn assertiveness training when they're teenagers that in martial arts okay well thanks uh, uh Thanks for that, Katrina. I mean, uh, I've just cut you off a little bit abruptly there, but uh, sorry, it's just the, the technology. And just so the audience m realizes we are kind of even uh, actually having two autistic people involved in this event is quite challenging with the with the technology. Um, what I'm what, so I want to thank you for you, for your talk and we're going to pick up on some of these things uh, in the questions. And uh, I now have the uh, unenviable and uh, anxiety inducing task to uh, open up uh, the Q&A and to read out the questions and I'm just letting you know we we've we finished this section a little bit early because but we'll need it anyway we've got 71 questions <laughs> so that's a real challenge uh, to get through so what I'm going to do is uh, hopefully kind of go through those questions and um, if yourself and Lindsay uh, you can decide which one of you wants to respond to them but if you could keep your answers really brief um, and I think the thing is we can put the link up to Swan anyway so if you don't get all your questions answered or you think our response was way too brief uh, which probably they will be uh, you can follow up with Katrina outside this forum and I think that's really important because actually I don't know if I'm going to get through the, the 71 uh, questions so I'm going to um, just scroll through now and um, start from the earlier ones so let me just uh, quickly flick through um, some of them some very common uh, issues that have that have that have come up um, uh, in in the questions so let's have a have a have a go through hang on there's lots of stuff about slides uh, okay what support can autistic people who've had a, an initial diagnosis but waiting for full assessment um, and the person's put several years queue um, interrupted by COVID. So what support um, can autistic people have who are just still waiting on the issue of diagnosis? And I might add that too, there was another question about the access to work scheme, which is put out by the UK government. Uh, do you have to have a formal diagnosis to kind of uh, get access to those provisions? Okay, so the, 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 the answer to the first part of that question is um, we include and always have done uh, women, in fact, it was part of why Swan was set up was was to give something for women who were beginning to realise that they might be autistic, and um, because actually a lot of, lot of women are late diagnosed and, and only come to it later in life either because they're having some kind of crisis or maybe they've had a child diagnosed. So you know we're we're adamantly open to people who haven't yet had a formal diagnosis, and a lot of the women who come to Swan we're actually supporting them through that through that process. Um, so. Um, the other question was about the access to work scheme. Do you know whether you have to have a formal diagnosis to, to get access to access to work? I actually don't know the answer to that. I don't know if Lindsay knows the answer to that. Um, I would imagine you probably would, but I wouldn't like to say definitively because I don't actually know. Okay, Lindsay, do you know or we might follow that up? Um, my inclination, I'm, I'm not going to answer that because I thought I did know the answer, but it's something that I don't want to um, say yes or no to and then be wrong. So we can follow that up for you. Okay, okay thank you. That's a really, it's a great question because uh, yeah. it's always that tension between uh, having to have formal diagnoses uh, for these. Um, actually, I, I might put you on the spot. Actually, Joan, uh, who's our uh, EDI officer here, would, would you know any, anything about that, Joan? So here, uh, I, I can't respond to that. I, I would say that in terms of reasonable adjustments, normally you wouldn't need to have a formal diagnosis. And, and what you would be doing is identifying the barriers and the issues, and then the adjustments would be put in place to address those barriers. So if you're going by the words of the legislation, technically, Technically, they shouldn't need a formal diagnosis. Yeah, that's not been my experience. I have to say. Uh, okay, okay. Yeah. So we might we might follow that up because yeah. uh, what 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 we find often is that uh, government offices and actually even charities sometimes uh, stray away from the uh, actual Equalities Act. So I think that's a really good question. It's, it's and, a, and, yeah. 
It's a really good question, but also can I just add a wee bit in that it goes back to what I said earlier about the, the importance of goodwill rather than just sticking to the rules because, yeah. you know, I had an experience where I was at a university where um, I had a meeting with my director of studies, which was awful. It was horrible. And we'd set it up, she'd set it up in our city centre Costa uh, or some coffee, but let's not slag off Costa, some, some city centre, whatever. But it was very, very busy and it was very, very noisy. And it was really, and I actually said, and we had this really challenging meeting. And I said to her at the end, you know, if you want to get the best out of these meetings, setting it up in this kind of environment is not, not the best place to do it. And she went, well, you need to register with the whatever office it was at the university for me to make that a kind of accommodation. I just went, and what about as a human being, do you know? Um, and I actually refused to meet with her on her own after that, because I just went, I can't deal with someone who can, he's just, you know, that rigid in their, in their approach to supporting pe people with disabilities. So, um, yeah, it goes back to yeah. goodwill and, and treating people like humans. Yeah. So we, we will follow that up and I think as I said this is an emerging area so we will we will get back to you on on that question. Okay I've got a couple I need to keep moving through remember we've got the 70 questions so one of the questions was do you support students at all levels of education and the person was talking about their 11 year old uh, struggling at, uh, at the primary school if I could have a quick response to that and then I'll move on to the next question. Currently, SWAN is not resourced to support children. I wish we could. We're working on it and we, we will get there. Um, we are now trying to focus on the, we are going to be focusing on, to some extent, on the 14 plus age group, um, but we, we just don't have resources. I mean, I have, I'm the only full-time member of staff at SWAN at the moment, and then Lindsay and, and Lynn specifically for the employment project, although they're, they're doing above and beyond because they're wonderful. Um, but we are build, working on building resources, so we will do our best to get to the younger age group when we can. Brilliant. And another, just again, a very quick answer question. Is there, uh, is there another swan in uh, England, Wales, Northern Ireland, or is it just in Scotland? So at the moment we are we are Scotland, Scotland based and um, we are working in partnership with an organisation now that's based in Birmingham and Belfast and Scotland to do a, put on our online uh, 14 plus uh, forum and um, so we are expanding we do get inquiries from other other places saying could we help them set up a swan but there's never the resources really in place to do that but but now we've been given this partnership with Studio 3 is, is the organisation we've gone into partnership with on this um, and so you know it, we're very happy I mean the more we can spread this work the more you know the, the better because it because it works it's valuable it does it's it's, it's yeah so okay Sorry, Brilliant. But... Yeah, maybe you want to, those of you interested in setting up uh, other swans throughout the United Kingdom can contact Kat Katrina. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, really great question from Phil. Is there or should there be an expectation for employers to proactively include neurodiverse employees? Now, before you answer that, I think that's a really interesting question given I think about two or three weeks ago there was the first uh, uh, judgment in the Supreme Court in, uh, in England uh, regarding positive action under the uh, Equalities Act, their equality, their positive action provisions under the Act, but this is actually after 10 years, this was the first judgment. So, um, so yes, the question is about proactively, uh, should there be an expectation for proactive inclusion of neurodiverse employees? So over to either of you. Lindsay, do you want to have a go at that? I will, yeah. Um, I I don't know whether we can demand that people proactively include neurodivergent people any more than than any others. Um, I think that we would want to expect that employers would be proactively inclusive of a range of different identities and skills. But in terms of neurodivergent staff, I think that there's a lot of work going on around raising awareness of the skills and talents that neurodivergent people can bring and the advantages of having a neurodiverse team in the workplace, having people that think in different ways and the, you know, the, the sort of richness that that can bring to your team. Um, the, the funding that we get for the employment project, we are um, part of or we're funded alongside a, a range of other autism organisations and some of them and ourselves are working with employers to help them to understand what the, the strengths and the advantages are of neurodivergent people and, and for us neurodivergent women 
and um, there are, you know, particularly within within STEM and, and IT, there are organisations that do work very hard to proactively recruit and um, we work with some of them ourselves. So I think it's an area that's really growing as understanding of autism grows and people are aware of how we function and that we are actually very skilled and intelligent and able and capable people who can bring a great deal to the workplace. Um, I think that the expectation I would want to see there more than demanding that people um, proactively recruit is that they inclusively recruit so that they make their whole advertising and recruitment and interview process work for neurodivergent people and that they may say that they're specifically encouraging a diverse range of, of employees. But I think that as soon as you offer adjustments, if we're, you know, when we're talking about workplace adjustments, it's not just once you get the job, it starts right from the job advert, from the accommodations that you can make during the recruitment process, the application form and every element of that. So I think that by making that more accessible to neurodivergent people, you will diversify your workforce. Right, thank you very much for that. And uh, we probably could do a whole seminar on that quite separately. Uh, I've just got to read a couple of two comments and then on to another question moving through because time is moving. Uh, one person has said access to work is very difficult for autistic freelancers to access without official full assessment, both in terms of finding out what might 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 support them, but also uh, in being considered to have proof of diagnosis. And that person said this is especially difficult for adult women awaiting late life diagnosis, but may have a checkered work history due to a lack of previous support. The second comment uh, is, is that perfectionism is quite a problem when you're tasked uh, independently with uh, pieces of work. So they're great, great, thank you. And someone else said thank you for mentioning perfectionism again. So here's another question and again, short answers because time's moving on. Uh, what did you find, uh, what did you find relevant in terms of sensory bar barriers? This is, uh, is there some kind of catalog of the ones that you identified? I think this goes back to some of the themes that you're finding um, around sensory barriers. Well, I think most autistic people would agree uh, that the, the, the fact that, the, you know, diagnostic criteria and people don't seem to understand that sensory issues are probably the biggest challenge that we have in many ways, because if you're in an environment, it's not even just about, oh, it's a bit, it's a bit busy or it's a bit noisy. I mean, I can end up in pain if I'm having, to, if I'm being assaulted by fluorescent lights people clicking their pens, people rustling, you know, biscuit wrappers, and it goes on too long, you end up actually feeling that every crackle of a piece of paper is actually a blue. And, and you know, it makes it very difficult to function then, and it makes it very difficult to concentrate or to think, and then you end up sore. So um, I think if people could understand the importance of these, they would probably be more accommodating. I mean, I've had perfectly nice, intelligent people laugh when they've seen me with my blue Mears Erlen glasses for the first time, because they obviously think I'm being pretentious and wearing some tinted lens thing. Well, it's because I actually I have a, I have a visual processing difference. They call it visual stress, I think. Um, so just, you know, people being a bit more tolerant, accommodating of, of the sensory stuff, being able to wear, uh, headphones, noise, noise cancelling headphones, um, offices yeah, yeah. where people are not allowed to spray uh, hairspray or, or or perfume in the office. There's a whole list of things and we'll put it in our handbook, won't we, Lindsay? We're going to, we will, yeah. we will yeah. pull these up. So I think the thing is, again, just to emphasise to uh, folks, I'm not sure if I'm live, just to emphasise to folks that this is a research in action. So actually we'll be copying all these questions down as well and just to engage with SWAN I think the more the merrier um, and just to emphasise that SWAN not only is Scottish it's a small organisation it has actually uh, uh, limited funding uh, so it can't raise the issues and maybe one of the outcomes of today is actually we might be able to get a clear case uh, to get firstly proper funding so we can initiate different projects so one of the questions which I'm not going to ask you guys to ask but I'm letting people know because this is about information sharing is will there be work on access to the forces such as the navy and the army currently mm -hmm. autism is on the exemption list and uh, the person saying i've met many autistic people who'd be perfect for the role and some um who've avoided diagnosis so that they can join up and uh, um 
and the rule seems unfair. And you're absolutely right, the person who's asked that question. And, uh, um, you know, you, we need to get some more work. We need to run some test cases also around the question of uh, what exemptions are, are reasonable and which ones are, in fact, um, illegal. Um, but I am going to put a question to you again. We've got um, 10 minutes to try and get through some more. Is Swan doing anything to petition the government or change laws relating to autistic people in the workplace? That's the question. And more importantly, what do you think of the idea of creating an additional category uh, in the Equalities Act specifically to identify autistic people? So if we could have a quick response to that, that would be great. OK, so the, the Swan Employment Project is funded by Scottish Government as part of their Improving Understanding of Autism campaign. Um, and the, the first, I mean, it's a several phase campaign. And the first phase, it, they focused on employment and uh, community access and Swan's employment project uh, won, won one of the, the funds. So um, what we are doing is part of that um, raising awareness of, of the issues around employment funded by Scottish Government. Um, so that's, I hope that answers your first question. And actually, you know, as a consequence, I'm involved in a lot of meetings, with meetings that includes, you know, strategy um, staff and the Scottish Government and all the rest of it. So these kinds of conversations are ongoing. So lobbying, yes, I do, I do a, a lo lot of lobbying. Um, in terms of the second part of that question, I, I don't know whether, whether Lindsay, you want to add something, but I, I actually think one of the biggest tasks we have now is to campaign to get autism out of a medical definition as a mental health disorder and redefined as a disability in, in parallel with the, the United Nations kind of definition of, like I say, it's somewhere between a social model and, um, and the medical model. I mean, a social model says you're only disabled if society makes, make, doesn't include you and disables you by not, not putting in inclusive practices. Um, the United Nations model is somewhere in between, which suggests that you actually do have, you know, an inbuilt impairment, if you like, or disability that does impact on your life as you go through it. And I, I would identify with that. But we, we have to get autism out of that, that medical model. Great. We've got about uh, we've got about five minutes. So, Lindsay, if you have a response, can you uh, make it short and snappy, please? No, I would just reiterate what Katrina okay. said. OK, so I'll move on to I think it will be the last question. I've actually it's from the two separate questions from um, two individuals. One is a nurse uh, with autism and it's about placement and work. And the other one uh, is working in the NHS. Now, it's a very long question, but they're, they're having any thoughts on adjustments that might be possible uh, within the NHS as a, as a doctor, uh, having to change jobs, locations, supervision and the hospital environment is also busy. Um, they're, they're interested in, uh, again, the, the emphasis, and we raised this earlier, the emphasis on us as autistic people uh, suggesting the adjustments. So they're interested in what your thoughts are on, uh, you know, on, on, on NHS adjustments for hospital work, some of the challenges and considerations. Yeah, I mean, I think it's like all these things. I think what the, what would be really good to do is to do collect that data from the experiences of of people working in the NHS and what what the challenges are, what what helps, and then and then training training NHS. I mean, I like training. I love teaching, and we do training from Swan. You know, we go into places of employment and we deliver training. You know, I've delivered CPD training in the past. I would be delighted. I'm sure we would all be delighted. I'm going to speak for Lindsay and Lynn here. Lynn's done an amazing job to, uh, on our on our training materials right from the get go, um, and. Uh, yeah, we, we're, we're here for business, you know, we will come into the workplace and we will train people and say, look, this is this is how we can help you, you know, make these changes for your autistic employees. Great. Uh, so so thank you for that. And, and actually, I've just been going through most of the questions that we've had. And thank you, people, for asking the questions are actually quite similar. And uh, as, as I said, this is the start of the process. Things like uh, examples, people are wanting examples. Uh, people are wanting to know what support they can have for juggling the disclosure, non-disclosure issue. Uh, my suggestion is uh, first, uh, first point of call is to um, contact Swan. Um, and uh, and um, uh, hook up with them, uh, raise your issues. And uh, I mean, one of the things that uh, Swan can do is maybe sit down and look at this issue and um, um, 
try to develop a strategy beyond the immediate focus, as I said, to just to emphasise that Squat Swan has, has limited funding. But this is also really important stuff just from today that we can mm -hmm. take back to the Scottish Government and take yep. back beyond the UK. So, um, so thank you very much. Um, sorry that we couldn't get through all your questions. Um, I think the, the important takeaway together that from today that I've got is, uh, is that, as I said, it is evolving and actually great minds working together to collect, for example, uh, and maybe we can put out a survey, Katrina, this would be quite interesting to see what reasonable adjustments people have actually been able to negotiate. That would be firstly good. We could have a survey yep. on that um, and uh, and what sort of issues that people have discovered and uh, to start working on a strategic approach to lobby. Also, there were lots of questions about how do we educate the employer um, and again, you might want to, as part of a survey, give some examples of what you've done. Uh, yes, SWAN does do training and uh, fantastic training and presentation of events, but um, SWAN is a small organisation, so we need to work out how to best um, manage that. So I'd like to thank everybody for attending today. It will be uploaded to the YouTube, um, University's YouTube channel, uh, a recorded event which will be captioned and uh, the slides will be made available and uh, and uh, we will continue the conversation. As I said, this is just the start um, and contact uh, SWAN if you look them up, SWAN, Scottish Women's Autism Network um, and I'm sure Katrina and the other staff would be happy to uh, in, indulge you and engage in your questions and hopefully we can kind of uh, get this thing moving. So well, thank you to well, Katrina I, and Lindsay. Can I, can I just jump in very, very quickly? So yeah, I'll, go for yeah. it. OK, a couple of things. Uh, one is that we have just been offered a little bit, not much, but a little bit more funding from Scottish Government to take part in a brand new national post-diagnostic uh, support service. Um, what we'll be doing is just getting a bit more funding to administer, doing more of what we're doing. So that's just a bit of good news, but do keep an eye on that because that, that there will be a website going off. It's going to be a, a hub. Um, for, for people going, you know, who've just been diagnosed. Um, secondly, I did do some research for the Right Click programme. So if people want to go into Scottish Autism's website and go into the support for uh, women and girls, there's tons of stuff in there, including a bit of stuff that I did about employment. And there was a third thing, but I've forgotten what it is, but thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, thank you again, Katrina. And just to remind you, if you want to find out about other Disability History Month's events, um, uh, there is a page link that's um, that's on the chat and uh, just to again remind you that our first inaugural Eddie Small Disability Lecture will be on the International Day of People with Disabilities on the 3rd of December. So thank you very much for attending.